That concludes the Stage 3 debate on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10623 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. You nearly caught me out there, but moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak on the motion. And the question is that motion 10623 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10624 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on stage one timetabling of a bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. And once again moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 10624 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 10625 on annulment of an SSI. And I ask Alexander Burnett on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Your apologies for my uh, tardiness. Uh, I refer members to my uh, register of interest regarding dear management, uh, and I move a motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Edward Mountain. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's always nice to know when you can make the whip. Uh, be short of breath in getting here on time. Dear, dear management is a complex issue, and reducing. Com uh, Deer numbers is not about culling males, it's about culling breeding females. And the breeding imperative of those females means that female deer will always find a male, and thus targeting males is futile. So the question on this motion that I posed at the committee was, do we need this? Well, the Deer Scotland Act 1996 already allows for the control of, out of deer out of season by regulation. And we can do that to prevent damage or to agricultural land, timber, natural heritage, and indeed for public safety. So it's there. We can do that. And every year, what's more, the Minister grants an automatic general authorisation to control deer on improved agricultural land and enclosed woodland. No one has to apply for a licence. It's there to do that. And the Minister does that. And I should also remind members that not a single license has been refused. So what will this SI mean? It basically means that every male deer will be a target from the day they're born to the day they die. It won't reduce the deer population by much, and it will mean deer are harried all year round. And what will happen to the deer that are killed late in the season when they're not fit for human consumption? Does this parliament really forget the 86 stags that were left rotting on Noidart? Is that where we want to be? So my question to the Parliament is, who, will, who do you think will use... I'm sorry, but I only have three minutes. I, I would love, if the presiding officer would give me more time, I'll, I'll take it. Am I allowed more time, presiding officer? Um, we certainly have some time in hand. Alistair Allen. I, 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 I thank the member very much for giving way. Um, he, he is raising uh, animal welfare issues. Does he not um, also concede that there are animal welfare issues associated with the overpopulation of deer numbers which we currently have and which this measure is seeking to address. Edward Mountain. Leah, I absolutely take that point, but it's not the welfare of those stags that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the stags that we're talking about shooting. The overpopulation can be controlled by good management, and that's what deer managers should be doing. And it's not deer managers that will be using this. It will be other people who aren't interested in the deer who will be using this SI. They're doing it to protect flora and fauna, which probably means eradicating deer in many cases. So let's talk about the welfare. What we're talking about is shooting stags all day, every day, or male deer. Random killing, no selection. And what that means is if you're not selecting the stags, you will often see juveniles mating with their mothers or indeed their sisters. Now, the dichotomy that this parliament faces is that we try and protect things like rabbits, blue hares, beavers, all of which eat trees, 
and then in the same breath we go out and declare all-out war on stags and male deer. I'm afraid that's just not balanced. So do we need a motion to annul? I don't believe we do. I think there's already sufficient scope in the legislation for proper deer management. No licences for killing male deer out of season have ever been refused. And just so the Parliament are aware, I had a petition of 1,686 people in a matter of weeks who signed up and said they thought this was outrageous. So I ask the Parliament today to join me to support good deer management and not by approving an all-out war on them. I don't think that does the Parliament any good. Thank you. And I call on Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When this uh, topic... Uh, Ms Wishart, if you could bear with me a, a moment. Sorry, um, Sorry Presiding Officer, order, I, I failed at the beginning of that speech to declare my register of interest that I own land with deer on it. And I would actually say, I would actually say, Presiding Officer, in accordance... In accordance with the uh, standards uh, uh, recommendation, I want to be completely clear. I have over 40 years of deer management experience across a quarter of a million acres of Scotland. I have seen over 30,000 deer killed in order to try and protect trees and woodland. I believe I know what management plans are. I've written them for private and public bodies. And I think I have an understanding about deer. And I still stress for the fact that I think we need to manage deer and not cull them by all-out war. Sorry, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. It's not a point of order, but your declaration is now on the record. And I call on Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, presiding officer. When this topic came up at the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, I questioned the statistics about the growing population of deer. And I now understand these are estimated to be at over one million. I also took the view, given the debate in committee about annulling the SSI, that the culling of male deer out with the current close season required wider scrutiny. I've listened carefully to those with knowledge about deer management and considered closely the issues that have been raised. Some suggest that this would be an unnecessary change as general authorisations enable male deer to be culled year-round on agriculture land and in enclosed woodland. And I've heard of the impact increasing numbers of deer are having on the environment and also in terms of native woodland trees and on peatland. There's also a view that the change could raise animal welfare concerns. The Scottish Animal Welfare Commission considered the change and found no associated animal welfare risks, providing normal... I'd like to finish what I'm trying to say. Uh, the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission considered the change and found no associated animal welfare risks, providing normal requirement for high standards of public safety and animal welfare are, adhe are adhered to. So under these circumstances, and having taken on board all the different views, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be voting against the annulment and will support the SSI today. Thank you. And I call on Ariane Burgess. Thank you. Presiding officer, while I speak in this chamber, we are accelerating even faster into a climate and nature emergency. We must stay focused on this challenge, unlike the Tory government at Westminster, which today has unbelievably approved the largest untapped oil field in UK waters, Rosebank. The focus of this debate is improved deer management, and this is a critical piece of the puzzle for tackling the climate and nature crisis. In Scotland, red deer numbers have risen from 155,000 in 1959 to around 1 million in 2020. It is not natural to have this many deer and it is not sustainable. Deer love to graze young tree shoots, which seriously inhibits the growth of new woodland. Woodland that we need for capturing carbon emissions and meeting our net zero commitments. Too many deer also cause damage to farmland and to other critical natural habitats in Scotland. Habitats that we need to allow other species to survive and nature to recover. Without getting deer back down to a sustainable level, we have no hope of reversing the climate and nature emergencies. And Labour knows this. That's why their manifesto pledged to support the implementation of the deer working group recommendations, including removing closed seasons for male deer. Ms Burgess, if I may just ask you to pause for a moment, I would be grateful if conversations could cease. Ms Burgess. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
The Tories raised concerns about animal welfare. Nobody wants to kill healthy animals. But if we don't rebalance our ecosystem, far more animals will suffer and many more species will go extinct. That's the fact of the matter. And that's why the Deer Working Group proposed this change, which major animal welfare organizations also support. Deer stalkers have a very tough job, a key green job requiring skill and care. It is valued. These jobs will continue to be of the utmost importance long into the future. Scottish Environment Link asserts that achieving and maintaining lower deer numbers will lead to an increased demand for stalkers, not less. Further jobs and community wealth can be created by supporting more local processing units and shared larders for venison in rural communities. Stalkers are already culling almost half of all male deers culled out of season. This order won't require anyone to start doing this. It will simply remove barriers for those who wish to continue culling deer in more months of the year, as in England and Wales, and in line with our government's essential focus on tackling the climate and nature emergencies, including meeting the climate targets which this parliament brought into law. I urge members to vote against the motion to annul the deer and close season order. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Lorna Slater to respond. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are in a climate and biodiversity crisis. The evidence is clear that if we are serious about protecting our environment and restoring Scotland's forests, we must reduce the devastating damage caused by deer. The only effective way to do that is to bring down deer populations and to reduce deer densities. We have tried a range of methods over the last 50 years, yet the population is now double what it was 30 years ago. This growth, no, sorry, I will not. I've, I've got only three minutes. This growth is unsustainable and action must be taken. The proposed removal of male close seasons is one of the recommendations made by the Deer Working Group in 2020. As I set out to the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee a fortnight ago, this change is just one part of a wider package of changes to modernise deer management in Scotland. It will increase the tools available... Y yes, I will take an intervention from Rhoda Grant. Rhoda Grant. Concerns that with or without this legislation, stags will be shot out of season at a time when they're unfit for human consumption. And it's incredibly wasteful at a time when people are suffering from malnutrition and depending on food banks. Will the Minister take steps to ensure that this wasteful practice stops and develops a long-term strategy to keep deer numbers at sustainable levels while making sure that deer shot are part of the human food chain? Minister. I'm grateful, I'm grateful to that intervention. We absolutely support the increase of use of venison, the increase of the venison market, and I think that's something we can all work on together, is how we get more of this venison, more of the deer that unfortunately we do need to cull for environmental reasons into the food chain to make sure we do tackle hunger. This legislation that we're looking at tonight not only increases the tools available to land managers, but it's to support deer management across the year, but it provides more efficient and effective processes for control of deer by removing that administrative burden. It will allow land managers who wish to continue with a closed season of male deer on their land to continue to do so. As others have said on animal welfare, we have taken the time over the last three years to review the evidence, consult with stakeholders and seek expert advice. These measures are part of a wider package of deer reforms that will deliver many benefits, including native woodland expansion, protection and enhancement of peatlands, and reducing human health and safety concerns. Since, since these recommendations were, were made by the Deer Working Group, the climate and biodiversity crisis has only deepened, and the evidence for the need for urgent action to manage our deer population has grown. I ask members to stand by their commitments, reject this motion, and support our efforts to restore nature. Thank you. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 10626 on approval of an SSI. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Finlay Carson.
Sir, uh, part of the purpose of this instrument is to permit the use of night sites for the taking or killing of deer. The objective is to increase the tools available to land managers when undertaking deer management by supporting the use of a wider range of firearms, which may be more readily available to those who are managing land for a range of purposes and support culling efforts at all times of the day and night. There is no doubt control is essential if Scotland is to reach its biodiversity and nature goals, and this legislation will assist in adding an additional tool to the toolbox of those controlling deer at night. But I have significant concerns about the, concerns about the safeguards that this legislation lacks in relation to animal welfare and public safety. Practitioners responsible for managing our deer population felt that they had little time to respond to the consultation, and their overall response was generally negative. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association do not support the measures which, in their view, would lead to night shooting becoming more of a norm in Scotland. In relation to animal welfare concerns, research by the Royal Dick Vet School found that culling by rifle at night was the least effective method in placing a shot that would quickly kill a deer. This legislation would mean that a single authorisation for Nature Scott would cover lamping and the use of night sites. It does not require people to have experience, and, it, uh, to, and to be on, uh, I beg your pardon, it does require people to have experience and to be on the fit and uh, competent register. However, there is no differential in the experience in using lamping and the use of night sites, which requires a different skill set, training, and different equipment. Operators not experienced in night sites could potentially be prevented from obtaining authorisation to undertake other forms of culling at night, including lamping, which they are currently authorised uh, to do. Nature Scott did not recommend that further training be required or any need for additional assessment of an operator's ability to competently cull using night sites. The legislation or guidance fails to stipulate or specify a minimum standard of scope which would ensure the highest of standard of animal welfare and public safety. That is why I join stakeholders in expressing fears that the legislation does not require appropriate uh, and uh, proportionate licensing or even mandatory training. Finally, I do not accept that there are no animal welfare implications of these provisions. Laws are regularly passed in this place, enhancing the protection of wildlife. And it's absolutely bizarre that Lorna Slater wants to remove safeguards, which would potentially lead to deer being harried and hunted 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, with no additional training or licensing requirements. Surely this is not a good look, and indeed goes against all this Parliament's efforts to improve animal welfare. This government's approach, after many years of inadequate intervention, appears to be a declare, to declare all-out war against our iconic deer population, with very little regard to animal welfare. This is not a position I am willing to support. This government needs to rethink this unfortunate and potentially dangerous approach to deer control. Thank you. And I call on Minister Lorna Slater to respond. Permitting the use of night sights and increasing access to non-lead ammunition by reducing the minimum ammunition weight for shooting deer will support land managers to better manage deer. Scotland's deer population has doubled since 1990, causing significant environmental damage and must be addressed urgently if we are to tackle the climate and nature emergencies. These measures, as discussed previously, are part of a wider programme that is aimed at doing just that. They also fulfil the recommendations made by the independent Deer Working Group in 2020, which most parties in this chamber have endorsed. We have fully considered the potential implications prior to bringing forward these recommended changes. Nature Scott completed trials into both recommendations and published reports on their findings. Through these trials, no additional adverse impacts on deer welfare... Yes, quite, very short. I don't have much time. Edward Mountain. Um, excuse With me a thermal moment. sight. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Mountain, if you wouldn't mind beginning again as your microphone wasn't on. Sorry, sorry, Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you for confirming Nature Scott carried out trials. Could you confirm they carried out trials shooting at night with thermal images and lighter weight bullets, or was it during daytime? Minister. They carried out trials into both of these uh, bits of legislation that we're bringing, both the night sites and with the lighter weight ammunition, because they're attacking a a slightly different issues, and no welfare issues were shown. With respect to the night sites, the current practice is to use lamps 
to, to see the deer and, and manage them at night. These new technologies allow this to continue, and there was no additional welfare concerns raised through the use of these new technologies. We also sought the views of animal welfare experts through the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission, who found no issue with these proposals. Shooting deer at night is a widely used and essential part of deer management. As we look to step up our deer management efforts, it is vital that deer managers who are authorised to shoot at night have the best technology available at their disposable. The use of night sites will allow for longer deer shooting hours, especially in the winter months, and more effective culling operations. Deer can only be shot at night under strict authorisation from Nature Scott, and deer managers must prove they are fit and competent. This means that they must undertake training and achieve a recognised qualification. They must also meet all of the usual requirements to carry a firearm and, with the night shooting, and comply with the night shooting code of practice. Nature Scott's report was clear that there are no additional training requirements above those already in place for deer managers who wish to use one of these sites rather than the traditional use of a lamp for night shooting. The proposal to reduce the minimum ammunition weight to shoot deer will make non-lead ammunition more accessible. This removes a significant barrier for deer managers at the moment and will reduce the amount of toxic lead in our environment. Furthermore, many venison retailers are insisting on a supply of lead-free venison products and we want to maximise the venison that makes, its way, sorry, that makes its way into the food chain. Combined with Nature Scott's review, which found that these changes to bullet weights would have no detrimental effect on deer welfare, there is no reason for this barrier to remain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 10627 on approval of an SSI. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I moved. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Ross Greer. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Greens opposed this instrument and the tax breaks that it would give to businesses purchasing land or property within the two Scottish freeports. When we were negotiating the Butte House Agreement two years ago, our party in the SNP recognised that freeports were one of the small number of areas for which compromise probably wasn't possible. Just as SNP colleagues were not expected to support all green amendments to the Hunting with Dogs Bill due to the difference in our position on blood sports, green MSPs are exercising our right to agree to disagree with our government partners on freeports. In saying that, I do wish to pay credit to Tom Arthur and to Ivan McKee before him for the work the Scottish Government has clearly done to try and inject some fair work criteria into a freeport model forced on them by the UK Government. The issue here is the ideology underpinning freeports, and particularly the corporate tax breaks that they provide. It's that of trickle-down economics, and the Scottish Greens can't subscribe to that. The key selling point for the freeports is the impressive sounding number of jobs that they would create. But studies show that when the UK tried this approach in the 80s, four in ten of those jobs were just displaced from elsewhere, increasing regional inequality. As a West of Scotland MSP, I'm concerned that the fourth freeport in particular will only worsen the challenges that we face of depopulation and sluggish growth in wages across the West Coast, while the East sees both substantial population and wage growth. Most of what's involved in setting up the freeports is reserved, but there are levers within the Scottish Government's power that have not been used here, including to exclude any entity based in an offshore tax haven from accessing LBTT relief. We legislated for this before with COVID business relief in this Parliament, so what would have prevented a ban on tax dodgers accessing this tax break? It is within devolved competencies. We know from freeports elsewhere in Europe that businesses who operate from tax havens are attracted to this kind of operating model, because after all, what else are freeports other than many tax havens? There's a significant reputational risk to Scotland here, particularly considering the findings of the European Commission's report entitled Money Laundering and Tax Evasion Risks in Freeports. The EU is cracking down on freeports due to what it described as a high instance of corruption, tax evasion and criminal activity. But Brexit Britain is taking the opposite approach, setting up new free ports all over the UK. I recognise the Scottish Government's commitment to fair work, but in this case, in the case of free ports, it is just language and encouragement and guidance. There are no binding commitments to ensure that the companies adhere to fair work principles or clear consequences if they do not. And I recognise the Government's in a difficult position because this policy is ultimately being driven by the UK Government. De but devolution exists for the purpose of creating divergence where we believe that that is necessary. I do not think that the opportunity to do that has been taken in this instance. For all the reasons that I have outlined, as well as the objections raised by trade unions, environmental groups and communities, the Scottish Greens oppose this instrument. 
Thank you. And I call on Tom Arthur to respond. Minister. Presiding officer, at my appearance at the Finance and Public Administration Committee earlier this month, I set out the rationale of this particular tax relief in relation to supporting the wider Green Freeport programme by encouraging investment in and regeneration of underdeveloped areas. LBTT relief is a targeted relief which will apply in tightly drawn locations and only to those businesses that meet the relief conditions. Together with significant capital investment, the relief aims to help facilitate the creation of a large number of high quality, fair, green jobs, support the development of a renewable sector and help to accelerate Scotland's transition, just transition, to net zero. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion.